All right, so this is the first video in our series on functions of bounded variation. So before we really get started into the definition of what that really means, um, let's review a little bit maybe of um, some things that we've seen with monotonic functions. So let's begin with a definition. So suppose that we've got S as a subset of the real numbers, then we've got some function, um, some real valued function on S. We say that f is going to be increasing if you take two values, x and y, and s, and you know that x is less than y. Well, that's going to imply that the function value of x is going to be less than the function value of y. Uh, similarly, if we've got a function that's decreasing, we pick two values in s, and that x is going to be less than y. And if we look at the function values at those points, it reverses the ordering. So if x is less than y, then f of y is going to be less than f of x. Um, that's what it means for the function to be decreasing. So kind of putting these two types of functions together in one category, we could say that a function is going to be monotonic if it is either an increasing function or a decreasing function. So if we have a function f on an interval, closed interval a to b, and it's a real valued function, if we pick any value c that's in the interior of that interval, then let's introduce some notation for the left and right hand limit. So it's definition and really kind of talking a little bit about notation. So if we say that the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x, and so we kind of know what that definition, what that really means, well, we'll kind of denote that with this f evaluated at c, but then we'll put a plus sign right after the c inside the argument of the function. So that's kind of how we'll, how we'll denote the right-hand limit. And likewise, we can denote the left-hand limit. Um, so the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x. Um, we'll put a little minus sign behind the c um, inside the argument of the function. And so those are going to be true. So we'll say that f of c plus is going to exist and f of c minus is going to exist when those limits exist. Now, kind of where we're headed with this notion is that if we've got some monotonic functions and we start talking about discontinuities in those things, well, this, we can't just have any kind of discontinuity that we want. Um, actually, we're going to see that the only discontinuities that are allowed with monotonic functions are jump discontinuities. And that's really going to be um, the content of this next theorem. And so let's be a little bit more formal about this. So if we look at theorem 4.51, so if we've got a real valued function on a closed interval a to b, so our, um, our function f, and let's assume that that f is going to be increasing, then um, f of c plus and f of c minus both exist. So the left-hand limit and the right-hand limits exist for all c values in the interior of that interval. So as long as I'm in between a and b and not at the end point, those limits are going to exist. And furthermore, that f of c minus is going to be less than or equal to f of c, and that's going to be less than or equal to f of c plus. And then, of course, over here at the endpoints, we've got f of a is going to be less than or equal to f of a plus. <clears throat> and then over at the right endpoint, we've got f of b minus is going to be um, less than or equal to actual f of b. So now let's go forward and see if we can prove this theorem. So <clears throat> for the proof, uh, let's assume that we've got a value of c that's in the interior of that interval. Now, since the function is increasing, what we want to do is kind of isolate the range values for everything to the left of c. So we'll take this, um, the image under the function of everything um, from a over to c. Now, that's obviously going to be bounded by f of c, since c is increasing. 
And so what that tells us is that yes, sure enough, we do have a supremum. So that's kind of our prop one of our properties of um, the real numbers that if we've got to set this bounded above, then the least upper bound exists. And so that's the supremum for our set. Um, so, okay, we know that the supremum exists. What about the limit? Well, let's go back to the definition of a limit. So if we let epsilon be greater than zero, um, then by the definition of having the supremum, um, there exists some x naught such that um, if we look at m minus epsilon, that there's some kind of function value um, in between m minus m naught, m minus epsilon rather, and m. Otherwise, m minus epsilon wouldn't be a supremum. And so what we can do then is to take delta to be c minus x naught. Um, so that if we pick a value in of x in between x naught and c, then because the function is increasing, that guarantees that um, f of x is going to be greater than or equal to f of x naught. And um, because m is the supremum, it's got to be less than or equal to m. So what that ends up showing is that as long as x is in this interval between c minus delta and c, so if the distance between x and c is less than delta, then the distance between f of x and m is going to be less than epsilon. And so what that really shows us is that the limit um, as x approaches c from the left does exist, and that's actually, in fact, the supremum of um, the image of all the elements that are um, in between a and c. Um, it really doesn't take too much to wrap your mind around the fact that um, you can really do a similar proof and show that the limit from the right for C actually does exist too and that that's going to be the infimum of all of the numbers, uh, real numbers in between C and B. And so that actually shows the proof and um, kind of gives us really what we need to show that the only kind of discontinuities that we can really have for um, monotonic functions will be um, for those jump discontinuities. All right, so let's go on now. Um, for our next definition and kind of we can actually define that um, so if f is going to be an increasing function on a closed interval a to b then again c is going to be um, in the interior of a to b then we can define the jump at c to actually be this um, limit from the right minus this limit from the left and so that kind of gives um, a definition. Now what really kind of motivates our thinking about that is we can draw some pictures. So when we think of a monotonic function, then we can really think of something like this. We've got our x values down here on the number line, and the only kind of jumps that we can have are for or the, or the only kind of discontinuities that we can have is that occasionally we're going to take these jumps. And so for um, monotonic functions, this is kind of the archetype that we can have in our minds for um, what a monotonic function is going to look like. And so really that raises a question for us that if I'm kind of thinking of these monotonic functions as just kind of being these in a way step functions um, the question is how bad could my pictures actually get if I just kept adding more and more and more discontinuities um, can I put in a countably infinite number of discontinuities okay well can I make it even worse and can I put in an uncountably infinite number of discontinuities? Uh, well, the answer to that question is actually going to be, um, I can't just do anything that I want to do that the... Um, the best that I can do is to put in a countable number of discontinuities. And that's really going to be answered by this theorem that we have, this theorem 
So before we get on to that, um, let's look at a definition and of what a partition of a closed interval is going to look like. So um, if we take a closed interval AB, um, it's compact, so it's going to be bounded. Um, a and B have to be real numbers. It's not an infinite interval on one end or anything like that. Um, so we've got a partition of this closed interval AB is going to be a set of points, um, x0, x1, x2, all the way up to xn, where the x0 is always going to be my starting left endpoint. My xn is going to be my ending right endpoint B. And... Um, I've just got this sequence of distinct numbers scattered through here. Um, my kth subinterval is going to be the interval from x sub k minus 1 up to k. And I can talk about delta x sub k. Delta x sub k really just being the um, length of the kth subinterval. So that's going to be nothing more than x sub k minus x sub k minus 1. Um, for all these total possible partitions of this subinterval, I'm going to put those into a set and denote that set as this kind of script P um, and then followed by my closed interval AB so that you know what, what interval what I'm t talking about if it's not obvious from the context. So before we get to our theorem that answers our question, our theorem 6.2, we've got a quick stop here at theorem 6.1. Uh, so what's the context of that? Well, we're assuming that we've got this partition P of our closed interval AB. And what we're going to do is add up all of the jumps. So for each one of the points in the interior of our partition, we're going to add up the jump at each one of those points. And what will happen is that the sum of all those jumps is going to be less than or equal to <clears throat> the value of f of b minus f of a. And so let's see why that might be true. Okay, so we start our proof. Um, let's begin by looking at a motivating picture for that. And so we know kind of what our archetype of our um, increasing function is. We've got this partition here and then we've just got these jump uh, discontinuities along here. And so if we look at the sum that we're actually trying to find, then that really um, almost kind of looks like a telescoping sum. Not quite. Uh, but we can kind of turn it into and compare it to a telescoping sum, and that's what we're going to do. And so for each one of these um, subintervals, we're going to pick a y sub i in there. And because our function is increasing, what that means is that f of y sub i plus 1 is going to be greater than or equal to um, the limit as x approaches x sub um, <clears throat> limit as you approach x sub i from the right um, of the function value and f of y sub i is going to be less than um, the function value as we approach x sub i from the left so as we're approaching from the left um, our y sub i is in here it's going to be smaller if we jump to the next sub interval um, our y sub i is going to be bigger than our right limit and so what that's actually going to lead us to is this um, thing where we can put these together that if we take the difference of the y sub i plus 1 minus the f of y sub i, then that's going to be greater than what our jump actually is. If we add up um, that sum over all of the i's, then what do we actually have? Well, that's going to be smaller than the sum of our y sub i, f of y sub i's, which is a telescoping sum, so everything cancels. We're left with the um, last entry minus the very first entry. Now, f of y sub n is going to be less than our upper limit, f sub b, and... <clears throat> f sub y sub 1 is going to be less than our left endpoint over here at a, and that concludes the proof of our theorem. All right, so now we finally get to the theorem that answers our questions of kind of how bad can a graph of one of these monotonic functions actually be. 
And so our theorem 6.2 says if we have a monotonic function f on this compact closed interval a to b, then the set of all discontinuities is at most countable. So <clears throat> taking a look at the proof, so let's go um, without loss of generality. Let's just suppose that f is going to be increasing. If it were decreasing, we'd just do the same proof with minus f. So we'll assume that f is going to be increasing. If we let m be any positive um, real number, then we can define the set S sub m as just going to be um, the set of x such that the jump at x is going to be greater than 1 over m. Okay. Now for this particular set, <clears throat> if it were possible to take out n minus 1 points from this set S sub m, then that's we can make a partition out of that. So we just slap on x sub 0 being our left endpoint, slap on x sub n being b being our right endpoint, and voila, we've got a partition. And so if we, <clears throat> from theorem 6.1, we know that f of b minus f of a is going to be greater than or equal to the sum of all those jumps, but because those um, x sub i's came from um, the set s sub m, we know that the jump is going to be greater than 1 over m. And so that tells us that our sum is going to be greater than or equal to n minus 1 over m. Now that's pretty straightforward and not too bad, <clears throat> but if it were actually possible for us to choose as many points, so if there were an infinite number of points in there and we could choose as many as we want, then just by that summation we can see that we could violate theorem 6.1. So we could make this thing blow up if we really wanted to because m is going to be fixed and we can make as big as we want to, we can send that thing off to infinity if we had enough points. And so um, what we can conclude is that this S sub M can only be a finite set. If it were an infinite, we could blow up our summation and violate theorem 6.1. So our S sub M have to be finite, which means that if we take the union over um, S sub M for M being all the positive integers, then countable union of countable sets is countable. And so um, if we look at our set of discontinuities, well we know our discontinuities can only be jump discontinuities and so they have to be at some point we can find an uh, 1 over m that's going to be smaller than that and so our set of discontinuities is going to be contained inside this union of the S sub m and so what that means it's a subset of a countable set it has to be countable. And voila, there you go. We've got the answer to our questions. How bad can a monotonic function actually be? Well, we could have an infinite number of discontinuities, but um, that infinite number is at most a countably infinite number. And so this kind of gives us um, a little bit of idea of what monotonic functions look like once we start going on. Um, to our further discussion of functions of bounded variation. These monotonic functions are going to play a big role. So uh, stay tuned for the next video. I'll see you guys later.